David de Rothschild also works to promote justice. Justice for the earth itself, using exploration and storytelling as a way to give nature a voice. David has visited some of the world's most remote and fragile regions in order to attract widespread media attention for global environmental issues and their solutions. From March to July 2010, David and a crew of five sailed across the Pacific Ocean on Plastiki, a catamaran made buoyant by 12,500 reclaimed plastic bottles to draw attention to the vast whirlpool of plastic trash in the ocean. His internet portal, Adventure Ecology, is designed to inspire interest in environmental issues among school children. We can make saving the planet an adventure, says David. I want to make it so engaging, fun, and fascinating that they want to get involved. We give them a chance to grow their own world, create their own viewpoints, showcase them, and inspire others and don't underestimate kids' power to influence their parents. <laughs> Adventure Ecology websites include classroom lesson plans, reports on David's expeditions, and a gateway for children to learn about global environmental problems. David is recognized as a National Geographic Emerging Explorer, a Clean Up the World Ambassador, a UNEP Climate Hero, and a Young Global Leader. If someone you love has a health crisis, says David, you'd research. You'd find the best doctors, the latest cures, whatever it takes to get that person healthy again. Well, now our planet has a health crisis, but are we really doing everything we possibly can? If we fail, there's no second chance. Please welcome David de Rothschild. Thanks, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Really. Thanks a lot. He failed to add into the, the little list of things, really bad dancer, so I'm glad that those guys came out first. I was thinking about doing the whole thing in interpretive dance, but after, <laughs> as I uh, forget it. Um, I guess as a kid, I was the kind of kid that you didn't want to sit next to in the classroom if you wanted to get something done. My teachers used to write these crazy reports, um, you know, and they'd say, you know, test results not totally surprising, gives off the impression he's working, distracting to others, please don't send them back to our class again. <laughs> and my mum was like, I'm so pleased when you left school. I just hated going in there and hearing how bad my son was. Um, but the good news was I got as far away from the classroom as possible and ended up in some of the most extraordinary places and totally humbled by that. Humbled to be here today as well, by the way. This is an amazing audience. Thank you for being here on a Sunday. Give yourself a <laughs> round. Nice. So I end up places like this. This is in the Arctic, skiing very slowly, for many long days, going, what am I doing? Does anyone care? Um, you know, out here in the middle of the Pacific on the plastiki, bobbing around this time, like going, all right, this is a dumb idea. Um, <laughs> um, I love land. I'm like, every so often I'm just like, I love land. I get seasick in my bathtub, so that was a really dumb idea to, to sort of go out there and be like, I'm going to build a boat of plastic bottles and say, oh, yeah, well done, Dave. Um, but what strikes me, is, what strikes me rather, is, is rather kind of interesting, is this phrase. And whenever you return from an adventure, or whenever you have a conversation with someone, it's always that phrase that kind of sticks to me. It's simply like, so yeah, how is it out there? You know, out there, it's all right? Things good? I'm like, out there? What do you mean, out there? Well, you know, out there. I'm like, what do you, you mean in nature? <laughs> yeah. How's that nature? <laughs> I'm like, it's good, just try it, it's great. So I'm th sitting here, I'm thinking, what's going on? Why, what's, how has it become out there? 
So I go to the only place you need to go when you want to try and find stuff out, Google. <laughs> so I put in, what is nature? And, and it says, nature is Satan's church. So I'm going to use this opportunity. <laughs> it also says it's a tropical island gourmet, which is kind of exciting. But I'm going to use this opportunity to say, if this is Satan's church, and it's kind of hard to see, I guess it's a beautiful forest, the, the, the picture of the rainforest, then I worship Satan. I'm really sorry. <laughs> but I am in the house of Satan. But there is a serious side to this out there-ness that we've got ourselves attached to. We are waging a war on nature. I mean, we are really waging a war on nature. We've created this crazy dichotomy that on one side is us, and on the other side is nature. And we've totally externalized ourselves from the web of life. And we are churning through our natural resources at a rate that is totally unsustainable. We got nailed by the dude who put the, you know, the word debate next to climate change. Whoever that was, I hope they are hiding. Because it basically created this air of confusion. But there's no confusion whatsoever in my mind that there are human fingerprints littering our planet. And as I said, we really are having a go at nature in every way. I mean, look at this, for example, right? These are two everyday products. One is off, the number one selling bug spray in America. God forbid another species would land on me. Get off, right? It's like, and I love the fact they have a couple walking through the woods. It's like on a hike. I love that about Americans. In England, we call it going for a walk. In, in America, you get loads of Gore-Tex and boots, and you go like out to the park, and like, I'm on a hike. It makes it sound adventurous. It's like, no, you're just going for a walk. Um, and there's a green card to kill other species. You get a loyalty card now, it's like, right, I got five spiders, three bugs, three rats, two mice. How you doing? It's like, well, I got a card. I mean, it's kind of nuts. And we're getting to the point now where we're even with building fake nature, right? This is a dome in Japan that is $300 million investment, retractable roof, beautiful sand, just like the real thing. Doesn't stick to your skin because it's crushed marble. Perfect temperature, blah, 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 blah. It goes on and on. There's a whole litany of things in this brochure. And I don't know if you can see, but it's built 300 yards away from the real beach. <laughs> I know. We'll build a massive structure next to the beach so we can swim and pretend we're in the beach. Just go to the beach. It's right there. Like, what are you thinking? <laughs> But the seriousness of it, as coming back to that, is like we are creating these human fingerprints. Species loss, undeniable, fastest rate ever. UN report out this year saying 200 species a day potentially being lost. 200 a day. We're one of those species. We don't look shinier, have better clothes. I don't know, gorillas got pretty cool clothes. Um, but you know, we are one of those species. Topsoil erosion, water pollution, fish stock you know, in, in decline. Like, these are undeniable. So the next time someone says to you, well, this climate change thing, eh, it's like, species loss, blah, 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 blah. These are undeniable. These are direct results of your and mine everyday actions, what we do, how we interact, our products, our services, direct result. And don't forget that, because you then also know that as you're causing that problem, the ability to do something about it. I call it, basically, we're playing death Jenga. Never know the game? Jenga, right? So this is, this is us, right? That's, that's, that, that's, like, that's every system on our planet. And every time we remove a block, you know what? Take rid of the lemurs, get rid of clean water, get rid of this, the block gets a little more wobbly. And anyone who knows how we play Jenga, when you play it, it doesn't just go, oh, I'm going to fall over now, hold tight. It slams down and it's over. <laughs> And so we are honestly playing a game of death Jenga with our planet. And what's scary about it is that we're pulling pieces out that we don't even know what they are. We've got tens of millions of species on this planet, and we only know a few of them. It's kind of nuts that we live on a planet that we so-called explored, yet we only know a few of the species, and we've only documented a few of them, and we're not even bothering to document them before they're going, becoming extinct, and what their role plays. So death Jenga, should, dot com, someone should buy that now. <laughs> So one of these human fingerprints is waste, and this is, I became obsessed by waste, um, mainly because it's something that's so real. The environmental movement has been very good at kind of just refining environmentalism into carbon and into energy. It's like, 
Who knows what a ton of carbon smells like, tastes like, feel like? Same with energy. When was the last time you saw a kilowatt of energy walking down the street? Oh, hey, I'm a kilowatt. You know, it's like we, we just don't have any concept of what it feels and touches. But, you know, what it's, it, and, and we're a society that's all about tactility. We're a society that's all about touch and feel and smell and taste. I mean, the impulse purchase has gone nuts. You walk into a convenience store nowadays, and it's like, someone's like, that'll be $5. And you're like, who said that? You know, and stuff is stacked high everywhere. And you're like, I have one of them, I have one of them. You know, we're about touch and taste and all those things. That's how we're sold things, stuff. It doesn't make us happy, by the way. Um, and waste is prevalent. It's just everywhere. No more than this guy, Mr. Plastic Fantastic. This is the guy who, you know, hey, 1907, Leo Hendrik Baekeland introduced the first fully synthetic plastic. Ever since that point, we have produced, consumed, and chucked an enormous amount of plastic that is still here. So next time you go out and you get given a cocktail stick and a swizzle stick and a, you know, plastic straw, you know, straws suck really bad, really, really bad. They're just pointless, right? But you, you, all that plastic, all that energy, all that water is going to be here somewhere. Atmosphere, oceans, landfill. It doesn't disappear. Nothing leaves this planet. It's all here. Think about that. Every single bit of plastic ever been produced is somewhere on this planet today. It's kind of nuts, and it blows your mind. So we've got obsessed by these single-use plastics, and we are literally churning through them. I mean, the plastic bag is the dumbest of all plastic items ever produced. There's no reason to have them. Sea turtles think they're jellyfish. These things are literally being consumed at a rate of 110 billion a year in the US alone. The great thing about plastic stats is you can make them up, because no one knows. It's brilliant. I could just tell you 120 billion, actually. And you go, ah, oh, great. No one knows. That's the crazy thing. But the, the this kind of estimate is 110 billion. That equates to roughly 20 million gallons of crude oil waste. I mean, or crude oil, rather. Waste, nice one. But crude oil into plastic bags and something used for 15 or 20 minutes. If we're running out of resources, are we really going to put all our energy and water into something that we just consume for 20 minutes and then throw out and probably ends up in a dustbin, a landfill, or ends up somewhere. It's kind of crazy. And that was what really struck me when I started reading about where it really was ending up. It's ending up in our ocean. 46,000 items of marine debris on or below every square mile of our oceans. I'll say that again. 46,000 items of marine debris on or below every square mile of our ocean. That basically, if you break it down, six bits of plastic, to every bit of plankton, right, in our oceans. That's nuts. Crazy for something that doesn't have to happen. The four main items that are in our ocean, plastic bag, styrofoam cups and containers, I mean styrofoam, should have disappeared with Tom Cruise in the 80s. That thing is just <laughs> awful, right? Styrofoam, bad. Plastic bags, dumb. Plastic water bottle, I don't even know where to begin on that one. I know, we'll put some water in a bottle and carry it around. Like, when did we all become so thirsty? It's like, why do we all have to hug a bottle of water? It's like, cut out the peanuts and the crisps and things, and you might not need to drink water so much, but in a plastic bottle, so that's the third. <laughs> How am I doing for time, anyone know? Because I'm totally lost on time. I've got, I've got 13 minutes left. Timekeeper, awesome. Love that guy. Stand up and give him a round of applause. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> Keeping time. So, basic... <laughs> Give me one more, give me two more. Go back up a bit, we'll have to bargain, we have to bargain with this guy. So, basically our oceans are filling with trash. I'm like, this is crazy, how come no one knows about this? Not only are they filling with trash, we're losing a million seabirds every year. A million seabirds, that's, a, that's an, again a, a stat, an estimate that people don't know about. This is a baby albatross, right? It's found on Midway Island, a little atoll all the way up in the North Hawaiian Islands. That's how it was found on the beach. It was dissected, and that's what was found inside. Over 300 pieces of plastic. And if you look at them, they're lighters, they're bottle lids, they're little clips for hanging wires. They're all the sort of stuff that we have in our everyday life, right? You're an albatross, you've got these big ass wings, and you're flying around. Ooh, and you're like, ooh, nice bit of shrimp or krill. And you dive down through the water and you grab a piece of what you think is shrimp. And it's a red Coca Cola lid, or it's a red bit of plastic off some toy, and you fly thousands of miles all the way back to your chick, and you throw up in its mouth, it's a really smooth move, and you go blah, 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 and the chick goes, thank you, I'm getting fed. No, I'm not, I'm full of plastic. 
It's so tragic and so unnecessary. And that's not to mention the hundreds of thousands of marine mammals every year. I'm sure everyone, who hates dolphins in here? <laughs> I was waiting for everyone to put their hands up. <laughs> no one. I mean, no one hates nature. I mean, you know, but we are waging a war on it. We are totally just going, right, get out, like you, nature. Bang, get off the stage. I don't want to share a stage with you. You know, what makes it even scarier is that plastic is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. As I said, it never disappears. Photo degrades. So basically, it breaks down and down and down and down and down into these tiny molecular sized pieces and lives basically subsurface. So when people hear about this Eastern garbage patch and they think that trash cruzos on there and plastic bag monster and all these things, it's not. It looks identical. It's far more ominous. It just looks normal. That's what's scary. It's subsurface. It's in the life layer, which is where the light can still penetrate the ocean, where the little guys, there's all these little guys basically running around going, and they're sucking everything up. And then, remember, six to one, plastic to plankton. And they're sucking up this plastic, tiny flex of styrofoam. And those are highly toxic nodules. And they basically then transfer waste that's going in our ocean via the plastic nodules into the fish, into the food system, into you and me. Who eats fish in here? Who eats meat? Who doesn't eat? Few of you, I know there's a few of you out there like, man, I've been, I'm on a 55 day fast. <laughs> Should try it. I'm like, you don't look well. Um, <laughs> but basically, we are poisoning ourselves. I mean, this, you know, the reason why I mentioned meat, people are like, well, fish, meat. Most intensely raised cattle is fed on fish meal, right? So, so we've got to start helping our oceans, really, in a big, big way. And that was my thing. It was like, how do we go from the dustbin into the ocean. How do we make that connection for people? Because it's like, I've done my bit. I put in the dustbin, I walk away. It's done, gone, over. I don't make the connection. So I thought I had a brilliant idea. I was going to take a bunch of artists. I was going to go out, collect some plastic, create art installations, go to galleries, show it. I was like, from, you know, from sea to show. I pitched this great big thing to a guy called Jeff Skull, who just made Inconvenient Truth back in 2006. I was like, Jeff, this is the best thing. Al Gore, boring. You know, come on, man. Artists, ocean. The guy can get away with doing a slideshow on climate change. We can take artists. And he just went, mm, kind of sounds dull to me. And I was like, oh. So I left with my tail between my legs. And I was sitting on the plane. And I was like, if I'm going to create an ocean adventure, it has to be of a magnitude. It has to have some impact. It's just got to be big. It's got to be something that it really inspires people. 1947, a guy called Thor Heyerdahl sailed a raft across the Pacific. It's called the Contiki. So sitting there looking out the window of a plane, yes, I fly, I'm really sorry, it's awful. You can like throw shit at me now, just do it, throw it. Um, the plastique was born. <laughs> this was one of the main photos that influenced me. I was like, that's, and you can look at that and go, whoa. You can either look at it one way and go, that's disgusting, or you can look at it the other way and go, here is a resource manager. <laughs> it's a pretty smart dude, probably making a lot of money from that. So I use this thing called the equation of curiosity which all of you can apply to everything you do in everyday life. It's what I live by. It's, what, it's like my mantra for every single thing. Curiosity is a great driver of change. When you take a dream and you percolate in your head and you throw it out there to your friends or whoever is around you, that becomes the adventure. The adventure begins. Those adventures percolate stories, and those stories inspire more dreams and more questions. So don't underestimate the power of curiosity, and that's why kids are going to change this planet, because they have an unbridled sense of curiosity, an unbridled amount of energy, and they can go out there and dream bigger, faster, better, and they get on with it. So the equation of curiosity, <laughs> the equation of curiosity is, is at the heart of everything. So I started doing some sketches. How am I doing on time? I know I'm running real late here. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Can I have ten? <laughs> start with nine. All right. So we start like, doing sketches. I love this one with the ducks. I'm like, I'm thinking ducks are going to pull my boat across the Pacific. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. This was one of my first sketches I did at the Plastiki back in, this was early 2007. I love how kind of grand I went. I'm like, I'm going to make a plastic ferry and put people in sleeping bags <laughs> on the outside. I was like, what was he thinking? I mean, as if it wasn't crazy enough already, people were like, you want to what, transport like 100 people on this thing? Like, what do you want to do? Um, <laughs> but I did have. I, you know, some of the things that we sketched there, like putting in um, you know, the plastic bottles in the sale, actually came to fruition, which was pretty cool. So I was lucky to meet an, an architect 
He used a lot of biomimicry. One of the main things that we focused on was the, the, the pomegranate as a source of inspiration of how pomegranate packs its seeds together. And then it basically formed the shape of the hull. So we used lots of biomimicry, nature-inspired design in our boat. The brief was the bottles had to be visible and functionable. They couldn't just be like, oh, we've built this massive boat, and then we'll just plonk a bottle on the, you know, on the mast. And like, hey, bottle boat. It had to be part of it. So we went for this crazy idea. We started bundling together. We ended up with this pond skater. Started to try and make it. <laughs> Didn't work. Buckminster Fuller, a genius, said, you find out what it is when you find out what it isn't. We found out pretty quickly what it wasn't. It was a necessary failure for us. We took it to a naval architect. He said, ah, you've obviously never sailed. I was like, nope, seasick in the bathtub. That's me, no idea. Why? He's like, massive waves, huge forces, going to break it apart. I was like, really? Come on, this is so cool. Little pomegranate action. He was like, no. <laughs> so boring. So he gave us this amazing like, drawing. He said, you're going to create a frame. You're going to have a frame to put the bottles in. I was like, that's dope. So we went out and we created this, which was this amazing 3D graphic. And we're like, look at us, world. We're going to build this. <laughs> Reality was, I was in San Francisco on this a plywood thing with rope and bottles, but I was telling everybody, this, no clue how to make it. Media are going, wow, how are you going to do that? I'm like, magic. You watch. <laughs> that, that, mm. so close, so close. <laughs> so as you can see, it was made of plywood, and that was, you know, really was like, oh, all right. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not really kind of cool. It's not going to set the world on fire if we make it out of plywood. And this was a real tipping point. So I, I kind of went around looking for different types of materials, and we found this like eco lumber, eco timber. And basically, we figured out that it was useless. It was, it was put across as this amazing material. Plastic bottles, it's like awesome. You know, it's going to set. And I was like, this is it. We found our thing. We put it on the crate, and it just sunk. And I was like, Ugh. this is a point where I got to walk out and tell everybody that I'm going to fail. I went, I don't want to fail. I don't want to let go of this dream. I've got to keep going. I've got to find a way. And I read this quote from Buckminster Fuller, basically saying that pollution is nothing but the resources we aren't harvesting because harvesting, we're ignorant of their value. Totally changed my perception on plastic. Totally changed the way I thought about the project. Stop looking at plastic as it had to be recycled, but I'm saying, is plastic to blame? Or is it our inability to understand how we use it, how we design with it? More importantly, how we dispose of it. Waste is fundamentally inefficient design. Nothing more than that. Dumb design equals waste. So then I started thinking about that and innovating, saying, well, we've got to create some new materials. So we went off around the world, tried to figure out who was doing cool stuff with plastics. We came across some crazy scientists in Denmark. We came across another company in the US. Took some pieces from here, pieces from there. Whacked it all into a bowl, mixed it with some eggs. Leave the timer on for three minutes. <laughs> Chucked it into our rental house oven. Landlord came in, the whole thing was on fire. <laughs> about, a, about six months of R&D in the oven. Is it cooked yet? Um, we finally came up with a material, self-reinforcing plastic. A plastic that uses its own matrix to support itself. So take a plastic water bottle, and you can now create a material that can build houses, cars, wind turbines. So no longer is plastic just seen as plastic for a plastic water bottle that ends up in landfill. A plastic water bottle can be turned and go up the cycle into anything you want. So this was a huge breakthrough in the terms of the value perception. Totally revolutionary. We were off. How long? I've got five minutes. Five? Is that 15 or five? Five. <laughs> we were suddenly like off. We hired ovens. We made all, this was the material in its original form. We had to figure out a glue to stick the boat together. This was when we, again, we were like, what do we use? Epoxy? Oh, great. We've gone to all this effort to then use one of the nastiest man-made glues known to man. Oh, great. So we had to go out and innovate a new glue, and we did. We went out, and we built, a, 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 we worked with some chemists, and we came up with a glue. It's based on cashew nuts and sugar. So the whole boat was stuck together with cashew nuts and sugar, a bio-based, totally benign epoxy. My mum freaked out. <laughs> what? The boat? I got it. I understood it. You're sticking it together with what? End the story. Hung up. Bing. Um, we assembled an insane team. It was just crazy. Um, we were so fortunate, everybody there was just like, I want to make it happen. Just make it happen. And we did. And we, had, we weren't boat builders, we weren't engineers, we were just passionate people who were committed to making something happen that was going to hopefully change the world. Or at least that's what we thought. 
You know, you've got to think that. We're at an age now where we've got weapons of mass distribution, right? Social media. We are all individual campaigns waiting to explode, right? We can start a movement today from this room. There's enough people in here to change anything, right? It's so true. And we've got to stop this age of quietism, man. We've got to rise up and we've got to start taking control of our systems. And that's what we were doing. We were taking control of this dumb waste problem, inefficient design, stupid, stupid, stupid things that are affecting two minutes left. Let me give me four. I want to show them a video. So I'll just, so, all right, well, we'll skip this one. There we go. 15th of December last year, boat went in. 30th of March this year, the boat, um, 20th of March rather, quite auspiciously on, on the spring equinox, which was amazing. Because everyone was like, when do you leave? When do you leave? When do you leave? When? I was like, I don't know. We'll leave when we leave. And we left on the original birthday. I'm going to run a video. It's going to be three minutes and like 40 odd seconds just to show them what it's like. Is that okay, Tranquipa? Please. Please. All right. So this video is a little, little, little bit a taste of what it was like on board. And I'm sure all of you are asking, were there any big ass storms out there? Were there any scary moments? So I like, edited a little storm bit on the end for you just to give you a flavor. I don't know if we can dim the lights a little bit. Excuse me in the roof. Can we dim the lights? There you go. Nice. So have a watch of this. I think a really nice analogy to think about is diamonds. You know, diamonds are a commonly found, naturally formed material. And because of the story that we tell ourselves around them, they become, to some people, priceless. And so what we need to do is try and do the same and redefine the story we tell ourselves about plastic. change from being kind of like this for two days to being the complete opposite. We're going to get hit with 25 knots or suddenly on the nose. Not really looking forward to the five days of this if this is going to be the case. I'm just a little paranoid about losing bottles at this stage. I think we've torn this uh, head sail and a uh, few rocks have broken on the, uh, on the main sail.
so that has really been the thrust and energy of this project, is this desire to, to achieve at every point. And that's why we've broken so many boundaries and we've just crashed through all of these obstacles, through this absolute conviction that we couldn't fail, ever. Right. So, obviously we arrived into Australia and it was nuts. It was totally, totally nuts. And this was the scene, it was like, you know, the world's media had picked up on the story, 12,500 news blogs, lots of impact. But for all of that, the big takeaway message for me was that. It's about you, it's about you and me. It's about creating community for change. It doesn't matter how many news blogs you have. It's about understanding that we all have a plastique inside of us. It's really a metaphor for change. If I can build a boat made out of plastic bottles and sail across the Pacific, you can do anything you want as well. You can definitely refuse a plastic bag. You can definitely take a reusable water bottle. You can definitely ban styrofoam. You can become the change that you want to be. And it's so easy. It's just taking that first step and going for it. So I finish on a Buckminster Fuller quote. He says, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Which I think is a dope phrase. But then I thought, hang on. Ha. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a boat that makes the existing model obsolete. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, man.